All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, so um, let me just say that for this week, uh, this is what I have done, right? So there were some topics left from the, uh, the previous week, uh, from chapter 22. So these are um, basically the situation for uh, what happens if there's a, a non-uniform charge distribution. So I'm basically going to solve this problem uh, in here. And I'll explain uh, what happens in, in, in that. I mean, what's the main problem in that? So, uh, non uniform, basically using Gauss law for non uniform charge distributions. So, that's the, uh, the, the first thing. Then, uh, in chapter 22, there's also the topic of conductors, um, conductors in steady state. Uh, so, we describe the electric field produced by these and things like that. So I'm going to also mention these. And then yesterday, we we're just uh, I, I did an introduction to chapter 23, the potential uh, chapter, but uh, I haven't done much actually. So I have done just the, the user definitions of the potential concept. Um, today I have computed the uh, potential due to a point charge. And then I have done the um, the physics of this uh, hydrogen atom, basically, as an example for uh, computing the potential energy. So in any case, I mean, next week we are going to continue with this potential chapter. So there are many things that we need to do. As a result, uh, and just keep this in mind. Okay, so I'm going to therefore start with this problem. If you have questions, again, uh, just either write or just you can also speak up. Uh, just keep this in mind, right? So um, this is a problem of a sphere, right? There's a sphere with radius A, uh, but the charge distribution is non-uniform. Uh, so I think this is the center. Charge distribution is non-uniform, meaning that, uh, well, I mean, there are charge distributions in here, but the charge density is not constant. And so as a result, there's some kind of, um, Whatever, I mean, there's some kind of a charge distribution inside. So uh, the expression here uh, tells us about the charge distribution. So that means for a point at a distance r, uh, the charge density at that point is given as uh, b times r squared, where b is a constant. So that means like the charge density is exactly zero at the center. Um, it is largest at the edges, for example, um, and things like that, right? So we don't have. Um, the charge is not distributed everywhere uh, in with the same density. So this implies that, I mean, I cannot just write down the charge, the total charge on, on the sphere, for example, with uh, rho times the volume, for example, all right? So that's Q dot uh, four pi over three A cube. So that's not really the case. I had to do some kind of integration to find the total charge. Okay, that's basically the idea. Um, so in Gauss law, uh, on the right hand side of Gauss law, so there's some kind of a char uh, enclosed charge expression. And uh, to compute that enclosed charge for this kind of a situation, uh, we cannot use these kind of formulas and things like that. We have to do an integration. So I'm going to show you how to do this kind of an integration. So first of all, um, the charge density is spherically symmetric. I mean, it basically satisfies the basic symmetry requirement uh, for these kind of problems. So just keep in mind that the symmetry condition is important for uh, applying the Gauss law. Okay, so uh, so it's spherically symmetric, right? Um, so as a result, it is important to establish that uh, we still have the symmetry in here. So that essentially means that if I rotate the sphere in any way I want, as long as I, I rotate it around the center, obviously. Uh, in that case, in the final uh, orientation of the sphere, the charge distribution is still the same, right? Uh, so in any case, uh, for Earth analogy, for example, if you rotate the Earth, for example, all the places where there's atmosphere is rotated to places where there's atmosphere. And so as a result, you have the, the same kind of, uh, 
mass distribution, for example, right? Uh, so even though the mass density is not the same everywhere within the Earth, um, we somehow have uh, some kind of uh, spherical symmetry in that. In any case, uh, so I'm just going to solve this point. So, um, so solve these two problems, finding the electric field. I need to use the Gauss law for that purpose. But, um, but the real problem in here is to computing the, uh, the charge contained within a sphere. So as a result, as a sample problem, I'm going to find uh, solve this problem, right? So as a result, the first problem in here is to find the total charge. Total charge to the top on the sphere. Okay. So to solve that problem, uh, this is what we do. Uh, we basically think of the sphere as um, as an onion, right? That's the uh, the analogy that I actually uh, make. I think I have a problem with these kind of things. Uh, let me see if I can do this. Sorry about that. So I think I cannot do that. Yeah, I, I can do this, right? Sorry about that. So this is sphere, right? But I would basically um, consider the sphere as formed from many uh, spherical shells, actually, right? Yeah, even that is difficult. Sorry about that. Uh, so I think I'm going to stop here and then continue with this usual thing. Um, so in any case, uh, just think of this as like a union of uh, these spherical shells, right? Um, just like an onion is, right? So that's the idea. Uh, in that case, we will basically concentrate on a particular shell in here and compute the charge on that shell and then add them up, right? That's basically the idea, okay? So in this case, uh, what we are going to do is this basically. Um, so this is the real sphere, right? This has uh, this is the sphere with radius a, and then I'm going to consider a spherical shell in here. So I'm just going to exaggerate. Uh, so it has an inner radius r, and the outer radius r plus dr. All right, r plus dr. Okay, so there's an outer radius in here. Okay, so this is the shell in here, right? That's the region within the shell. Okay, so that's a shell. Uh, here, dr is the thickness. Uh, I'm going to assume that dr is infinitesimal. Meaning that I'm going to take the dr goes to zero limit, uh, limit at the end. Why? Because in the integration, of course, this is going to appear as the um, as the um, as the differential in the integral, right? Uh, so as a result, this is a very small quantity. So I'm going to make that assumption that dr is really small in here. Right, so as a result, this is a very thin shell, right? In that case, we just notice that if dr is really small, uh, in that case, uh, basically rho is constant, the density is constant on the shell, okay? So on the sphere, the density is not the same, so the density is different at these different points, but if you just think about the points on the shell, um, on in here, the density is almost constant, right? So that's the, uh, that's the uh, thing that I'm going to use. So therefore, if I say dq is the charge on the shell, charge on the shell, and dv as the volume of the shell, volume of the shell, sorry. Okay. Uh, in that case, the charge on the shell is basically the density times dv, okay? That's basically the idea uh, in here. Uh, so what I'm saying is that 
I cannot do this for the whole sphere because the density is not the same everywhere on the sphere. But for the shell, uh, since the density is constant on the shell, I can do that for the shell, right? Uh, so I'm going to repeat this for different shells. For different shells, this, this is going to be different. That's the only uh, complication in that. So I'm going to use the differential uh, DQ for the charge and the volume because these are also infinitesimal, just like ER is. But just keep in mind that these are probably not, they are not necessarily differentials, right? They are infinitesimal, but we basically express some kind of a quantity in there. Now, here the problem is, of course, first to express the volume of the shell, right? Um, so the prescription in here is basically, it's very simple. We just take this as the area of the shell multiplied with its thickness. Okay, so the, the shell has some kind of an area in here. Uh, you can talk about, for example, the inner area or the outer area. Since they are very close to each other, uh, we can take uh, whatever the value in here. So that's basically four pi times r squared. And the thickness is dr. And so therefore, this gives us the volume of the shell. OK, uh, so that's the formula that we are going to use for the volume. And so as a result, uh, we are just going to therefore use uh, this product in here. I just not need to note in here is that sometimes uh, we also did use this as like, I mean, think of it like this. If V is a variable which basically expresses the volume of, sorry, R cube, so that's the volume of a sphere with radius r. Uh, in that case, I mean, think of it like this. Uh, this is such a sphere, inner sphere, uh, and the outer sphere is also such a sphere. And the, basically, the difference of such volumes, so that's basically the volume of the sphere with radius r plus dr minus the volume of the sphere with radius r, right? So that difference of the volumes is actually our volume of the shell. So therefore, I can actually express this dv as the differential of that quantity in here. But in that case, I can use the calculus formula. Right? That's also another point of view, actually. So it's the derivative of this function with respect to v multiplied with dr is going to give me a and give me the volume. Uh, so that's basically 4 pi r squared times dr. Okay. So in any case, the surface area of the of a sphere can actually be thought as the, the derivative of the volume of a sphere. I mean, because of that connection, right? That's also one of the things that you may want to keep in mind. Okay. So in all of these cases, I'm basically taking dr to be infinitesimal, meaning that I can ignore things like the square of dr and the cube of dr as well. So you may want to compute that uh, the volume of the shell in terms of, uh, I don't know, such algebraic expressions. But once you make these assumptions that like dr squared is negligible compared to dr, uh, that's the expression that you're going to get, okay? In any case, so dq is equal to rho times four pi r squared dr is the, the charge on the shell. And since the rho is b times r squared, all right, we have this kind of an expression in here. So that's four pi b times r to the four times dr is the amount of the charge on the shell. Charge, yeah, whatever. Charge on the shell, okay. So therefore, the total charge, therefore, is going to be the integral of that expression. And of course, this is just a symbolic thing, but it's just the, you're just basically adding up all the charges of the shells, which means, uh, right, I can basically convert it into this integral. So therefore, this is four pi b times r to the four times dr. And the integration is from the uh, smallest shell to the largest shell, right? So in terms of the radius, the smallest shell has zero radius, 
largest shell has radius a. So therefore, this is that integral. So that means this is like four pi b divided by five, a to the five, right? So the rest is basically calculus. Okay. Once we solve this problem, the rest of the uh, problem is actually simple. So I'm going to come back to the original problem again. So in part A, we are going to find the electric field for a point outside. And in part B, we are going to find the electric field for a point inside, right? So um, in that case, the problem is something like that. So that's R squared with radius A. Uh, let's just consider a point at a distance r from the center, and we would like to find the electric field at that point. And that's the question. To solve that question, uh, we use a Gaussian surface. So that's the Gaussian surface is a, a sphere that I'm just going to draw it as like a circle in here. So you, you actually, as, I mean, think of this as a three dimensional structure. So there's this uh, electric flux uh, through that everywhere on that surface. And this electric flux is related to the uh, total charge inside, okay? In any case, so the Gauss law in that case is E dot dA is equal to enclosed charge divided by epsilon zero. Um, so let me not repeat the, all the arguments in here, but in an exam, you have to repeat those. Um, basically, if you just follow all the steps, you can express this side as the uh, electric field, unknown electric field, multiplied with the surface area of the uh, whole Gaussian surface. So it's E times four pi R squared. On the right-hand side, we have just computed this, but that was four pi over eps, sorry, four pi over five, D, four pi B over five, A, to the five, sorry about that. Yeah, it's four pi b over five, a to the five over epsilon zero. So therefore the electric field outside can be written as uh, four pi goes away, um, b a to the five divided by epsilon zero times r squared. Okay, so that's the expression uh, for a point outside, right? Just keep in mind that this is essentially uh, the Coulomb's law expression, uh, but it's related to the total charge, right? So that's uh, one over R squared, and the rest of this expression here basically corresponds to, uh, to that one, right? I mean, just keep this in mind. You can also check for uh, dimensions uh, correct, whether it is dimensionally correct or not. Right? Um, okay. All right. So that's part A, basically. Part B, um, we have a different situation now. So that's the physical sphere of charge. So inside is filled, but I, I'm not going to shade that part. So the radius is A in here. So inside we have a point with a distance R from the center, and we would like to find the electric field at that point. For this reason, we use a Gaussian surface that pass from this point. Right, this this Gaussian surface, and uh, so the electric flux is basically a crossing the surface like that. So we again do the same thing, right? Um, so the integral of the e dot dr e a sorry e dot d a is equal to enclosed charge divided by epsilon zero. So the left hand side is still the same. It's computed in the same way. R in here is the radius of that Gaussian surface now. Now for this, the enclosed charge, right? Um, so here the enclosed charge is this pink region. Okay. So therefore, I need to use the same kind of an integral, but this time the integration integral boundaries is from zero to R. Right? Because I need to consider only the shells which are inside this um, inside this Gaussian surface. Okay? So therefore, uh, the integral should be 
from zero to R and not from zero to eight. So these outside charges should not be included in here. Okay, so that's the only difficulty. So as a result, we have rho times dV in here. Okay. Uh, but in any case, uh, the, so the density is B times R squared, and dV is still the same. So that's 4 pi R squared dr. However, there's this kind of a small problem in here. We have an integration variable R, but there's also, an, R also has a meaning as well. So as a result, there's some kind of a collision of symbols, actually. So let's just remember that the R in here is actually a correspond to, uh, to the inner radius well, these shells actually. So since I already have an R variable, I have to give a new name to these variables. So I'm going to call this as R prime, okay? Uh, so in here, therefore, I'm going to write this integration variable as R prime. I mean, this should normally be, be done because this is a dummy variable. Dummy variable means that this value somehow disappears at the end like an integration variable. Um, so within this integration in here, so this R prime variable takes all values between zero and R, all right? Uh, but once you evaluate that integral, the value of R prime will not uh, appear in our equations anymore. So therefore it's something uh, that we get rid of. So if it's a dummy variable, then I can give any name to it. Uh, so as a result, whether it is R, R prime or R double prime or S or I don't know, X or something like that, it's not, it's not very important, okay? Uh, I mean, it's just a small detail, but uh, sometimes this may actually cause some confusions. Just keep this in mind. So that integral is equal to four pi D, R prime to the power five divided by five. Evaluate it between R and zero, sorry, R and zero. So therefore this side is equal to four pi D over five R to the five. On the left hand side, we have a uh, four pi R squared. So therefore the electric field becomes um, D over five epsilon zero R cubed. Yeah, that's the expression. So that's for R is less than A. All right, if you just compare with the previous one, uh, I would like to basically draw the electric field as a function of the radial distance as a graph. So just keep in mind that this is the radial component of the electric field, it's just a scalar. So um, we have two different expressions inside and outside. So inside we have one of uh, an R cube behavior. So the electric field is proportional to R cube. And outside uh, we have one over R squared behavior. Okay. And the both expressions actually match at the uh, at the boundary in here. Okay, so the electric field is continuous. So uh, yeah, whatever. Let me, let me stop here. Do you have any questions about uh, this problem? Okay. So I'm going to state this problem, but I'm not going to solve it. Uh, so for example, uh, non-uniform cylindrical, cylindrically symmetric charge distribution. Distribution. In that case, we have a, a, a cylinder of charge, but these have to be like infinite cylinders, all right? Um, so, uh, I mean, it's the analog of the problem for cylindrical symmetry. So, we have a cylinder, infinite cylinder with radius A. And for any point inside, at a distance R from the, uh, the center, the density is, so the density at that point is given by, I don't know, uh, let's say C times R, okay? So in that case, well, I mean, you have to choose a Gaussian surface, which is a cylinder with a certain length and things like that. But the idea in here is this, uh, I mean, I have used the onion 
analogy for the case of spherical problems, here you have to use the, the leak analogy. So uh, just think of the cylinder as, as a leak like that. So basically this implies that you basically think of the cylinder as like formed from many cylindrical shells like that. So this is a, a particular cylindrical shell. So it has, it has a length obviously. And it has a ring shaped uh, cross section in here. And I don't know if the inner radius of the shell is R and outer radius is equal to R plus dr. In that case, the area in here, uh, area of the ring, is actually given as 2 pi r times dr. And uh, if the length of the cylinder is uh, L, in that case, the volume of the cylindrical shell, so that's the dv quantity in here, that's basically uh, the area of the ring multiplied with the length of the uh, length of the cylinder, right? And so as a result, you have like dq is equal to rho times dv, and so therefore the total charge would be uh, the integral of that expression, right? So because of the geometry in here, uh, the integral is going to be something like that. So all in all problems with cylindrical symmetry, we have this expression for expressing the geometry, but I mean, you have to think about the, uh, um, the shell the shell feature, right? Just keep this in mind. So I'm not going to solve this, but uh, I mean, there, there must be some problems with uh, non-uniform charge distribution uh, within this cylindrical symmetry uh, type of problems. Uh, so as a result, I suggest that you just look at, look at those. Okay. Um, so that's basically, I mean, it's just a mathematical explanation of what you should do if there is a non-uniform charge distribution. To find the total charge, a simple multiplication would not be enough. You have to construct an integral. Um, so I think the, uh, the most important cases are these, like the uh, spherical case and the cylindrical case. Um, I mean, you have to learn about these techniques because we are going to uh, actually uh, apply this to other kinds of problems as well. So these kind of integrations are integrations that you need a lot in physics. So the next topic is conductors. So the conductors have like these two kinds. We have either metals or ionic solutions. Metals or semiconductors, uh, there are various kinds actually. So the idea in here is this, so we have some kind of a material which might be a, a, a liquid in the case of ionic solutions. So there are some charges inside. Some of these charges can move freely. Right? So these charges are called charge carriers. And can move freely inside the material. Okay. If this is a metal, we usually think that the positive charges are fixed at rest because these are like the atoms, they stay there, and the electrons are free to move within the metal, right? Um, this is more or less correct picture. So, um, of course, it appears that the, the type of the charge carrier and their charges does not have any effect on what we are going to discuss next. As a result, it doesn't matter whether the positive charges are fixed or they are moving and, and things like that. So you can even think about situation where the positive charges are moving and the negative charges are fixed as well. Um, the conclusions are going to be the same in all cases. Okay. So the idea in here is this, um, basically if, sorry about that, uh, let's just write down like that. So if there is an electric field um, inside, so if the electric field is non-zero inside the material, uh, in that case, an electric current is produced.
which means uh, this then implies that the charge distribution uh, charge distribution somewhere uh, is changing changing as long as there's a current that means that there's some kind of a collection of I mean these charges will be collected somewhere and um, there will be some uh, missing charge somewhere else. So as a result, the charge distribution will be changing. Okay, so that's essentially the idea in here. Uh, I don't know. I mean, let's just throw it like that in here. So if there's an electric field inside this material, so the positive charges will be basically forced along that direction, and the negative charges will be forced along this direction. So eventually, you are going to find that the electric negative charges increase in here and positive charges increase in here. Okay. So because of that, these positive charges and those negative charges will actually produce an electric field inside, which is also called an induced electric field, right? So that induced electric field is opposite to the electric field that created the current. And so therefore it decreases that electric field. Uh, but as long as the total electric field is non-zero, this charge motion is going to continue, right? Eventually, it's going to stop, but we know that if it stops, then the electric field must be zero inside. And this is the situation that we actually described. There's this kind of a possibility inside a conductor. If there's an electric field, there will be a charge current. But let's think about a situation where there is no charge current. So that's essentially a steady state situation. Steady state. It's a situation where everything is settled. Everything is settled in their final position. And there is no charge current. There is no charge motion, right? So the idea in here is that what happens if uh, your conductor or your system is actually has reached to that steady state situation. And in that case, by using Gauss law and things like that, we can say something about uh, the charge distribution, right? So the first thing that we say is that, right? So that's basically no currents, which then implies that that's the first implication. The electric field is equal to zero inside. The conductors. Again, just keep in mind that this is in steady state. We're not talking about the other situation. So, if there is a current inside conductors, the electric field does not need to be zero. Usually, it, it is not zero. Right? Okay. Um, but if we are in steady state, then the electric field must be zero. Why? Otherwise, there will be a current, and uh, we're not in a steady state situation. So because of that, well, the charge density is equal to zero inside. So the idea is something like that. I mean, if this is a conductor, but there's a charge inside, right? In that case, if you use the Gauss law, for example, choose a Gaussian surface in here. All right, let's say it like this. In that case, uh, we should have like this relationship satisfied enclosed charge divided by epsilon zero. Obviously, this has to be satisfied everywhere. But if the electric field is zero everywhere, this has to be zero. Uh, but this implies that the enclosed charge must also be equal to zero. As a result, we cannot have this kind of a situation. Okay. So that means the enclosed charge must also be equal to zero. So there cannot be any charge anywhere inside the conductor. And no charge within a conductor, within the bulk, actually. It's actually called a bulk, right? But there can be a, um, a surface charge, right? Uh, so let's say it like this. All charges, if there are, are collected at the surface.
Um, it doesn't need to be, uh, but it is possible that, especially if the conductor has a, a net charge, total charge of the conductor is non-zero, but there will be some surface charges because it still has some charge in there. In any case, um, we basically have a, a sheet of charge in here, and we basically describe this sheet of charge with a surface charge density. All right. Uh, this is usually, um, I mean, for typical conductors, the thickness of that charge layer is about like one angstrom or something like that. It's about the size of the atoms. And so as, as a result, for us, this one angstrom is an extremely small distance. As a result, we mathematically idealize this sheet of charge as a, a sheet with exactly zero thickness. So that's the mathematical idealization. Um, it's actually a very thin layer of uh, layer of charge, right? Just keep this in mind. Okay. So in any case, um, this therefore implies that the uh, outside, sorry, outside electric fields. is, uh, can be non-zero, right? So I'm going to call these fields as like uh, E out. Okay, um, so let me show it like that. Um, especially if you have a situation where like there are positive charge density here, um, we know that the electric field lines uh, start from the positive charges. So therefore there has to be an outside like, electric field in here. Okay. And if there are negative charges, I don't know, in here, let's say, on that face, uh, in that case, the electric field lines should be like that. Because we know that the uh, negative charges are sinks of uh, field lines, so therefore the electric field lines end up in, in, in here. Okay. So there can be uh, outside electric fields. That's true. Um, what's important in here is that the, um, if the outside electric field is making an angle with the surface, sorry, uh, let me try to describe it like that. So that's a conductor, right? It's a conductor, right? So let's say that there are positive charges in here, but suppose that there is an uh, electric field in here, which is making some kind of an angle in here, right? So let's say that this angle theta in here is less than 90 degrees. Okay. In that case, well, what we say is that the, these positive charges are actually feeling this electric field because some part of that electric field penetrates inside the conductor. So as a result, uh, these charges are actually going to move parallel to the surface because uh, there will be a net force parallel to the surface. So therefore, there will be a charge current in here. Okay, so if that's the case, right? sorry about that, let me write it in here like this. If theta is strictly 90, less than 90, zero, then there will be a surface current of charges. Which then implies that uh, it's not a not steady state, right? It's not a steady state situation. So therefore, that's not possible. So uh, not possible. So this implies that the theta should always be equal to ninety degrees. Okay. So uh, in here, that's basically what I'm going to write. So outside electric fields can be down zero. But what we are saying is that the outside electric field is perpendicular to the surface. Okay, so that's important. It has to be perpendicular. So let me state this in here. So all, by outside electric field, I don't actually mean the electric field at a far away point, right? Uh, so somewhere in here. By outside electric field, I'm just 
talking about the electric field just outside the surface, right? Uh, just next to the surface. Uh, so that electric field is the one that somehow affects the, um, is relevant for the charges inside. And so therefore this electric field is perpendicular to the surface. Okay. All right. So number four or number five, I don't know. Uh, I think this is number four. Um, basically tells us that the strength of the outside electric field is equal to sigma divided by epsilon zero. And this is actually a very nice application of the Gauss law. So we just think about the situation where we have a conductor in here and let's say that this air in here. So we have a situation in here where the electric field is, uh, electric field is like that, right? It's perpendicular to the surface and just goes away like that. And let's say that there are like, uh, um, there are of course positive charges at the surface. Okay. So to find that relationship, we just have to choose a small cylinder in here, a small cylinder. I think I'm going to exaggerate a little bit. Uh, it has to be very small because the height should be very small, right? So you're, I mean, part of the cylinder is just outside the surface and the other part of the cylinder is just inside. Okay? So I'm going to call that base area as little a. Okay? In that case, uh, the enclosed charge is the charge in here, which is enclosed by the sphere. So that's... Uh, I think I'm going to use a pink color for that. So, uh, so basically that's the enclosed charge. Okay. So in any case, if we just write down the Gauss law for that, for this situation, uh, Q enclosed divided by epsilon zero, you can see that there's no flux on the inside part in here because the electric field is equal to zero inside. Let me also add this uh, somewhere in here as an equation. The electric field inside is equal to zero. The electric field outside is not. So therefore there is no flux in here. There is no flux on the side surface because the electric field is parallel to the surface. There's only an electric flux there is only an electric flux that's uh, crossing this surface in here, top base. In that case, the flux can be written as the outside electric field multiplied with the base area of the cylinder. Uh, enclosed charge is basic, the surface charge density multiplied with this air base area of the cylinder. Uh, that's it, right? Uh, so this A goes away. And so therefore, this then tells us that the outside electric field is equal to sigma divided by epsilon two. Okay, I think I, I need to add this. So that's four prime perhaps. If I have a conductor like that, right, with some, I don't know, sharp features like this, it turns out that, um, let's say it like this. So the surface charge density in here, uh, so I don't know, let's call this like sigma one, is usually larger than the surface charge density in these uh, other parts in here. So let's just call them as sigma two. Sigma one is bigger than sigma two. Um, you have, you don't have more charge collected in there. You have uh, you have a bigger charge density collected at uh, places where uh, the conductor has sharp features, right? So that's the the idea in here. So I, I think I'm going to write like that sharp. Okay. So in that case, if you just think about the electric field just outside the surface. Since the electric field is proportional to the uh, surface charge density, uh, you should have, um, sorry, let me draw these. So in this region, therefore, you should have a stronger electric field compared to that region. So if I call the electric field in here as E1 and that as E2, 
um, this also says that the electric field at the location one is bigger than the uh, electric field at the location two. So I, th I think this is something quite familiar. So if you have a conducting object, a charge conducting object, near the sharp features of that conducting object, the electric field is stronger. And so as a result, if there is some kind of a, I don't know, discharge of charge from conductor to the air, the most probable place that this happens is the place where uh, the, this conductor has is, is sharpest, all right? Uh, this is something that's actually quite known, but here, of course, I cannot prove this mathematically uh, at this point because I need some other mathematical tools for, uh, for doing this. Okay. There's one last thing in here, so let me quickly talk about that. So we have a conductor in here. And inside the conductor, there might be a cavity. Right? Cavities like, for example, think of it as air, for example. Uh, air in here and air is in here. And let's say, uh, I don't know, a battle in here. Right? So it's basically a region of air which is enclosed entirely by the metal. Cavity is enclosed by the conductor. Inside an ion solution, for example, this might be a bubble. All right. Um, okay, so in that case, the picture is something like that. So I'm just going to uh, draw it like this, right? So this is a cavity, for example. Let's suppose that the cavity contains the charge Q1 and Q2 inside, right? In any case, uh, in here, if there is no surface charge at the cavity, on the cavity surface, in that case, these charges are going to produce an electric field inside the conductor as well. But we said that that's, not, that's impossible in a steady state situation because there will be a current in here. So somehow, there should not be any... Um, electric field inside. So this can only happen if there is some kind of a charge distributed on the cavity surface. And so therefore, the charge on the cavity surface, so let me call this like, I don't know, Q cav, let's say, I don't know. Yeah, whatever. Uh, cavity surface must have enough charge so that uh, basically the, the, the charge at the cavity surface plus um, the other charges should be equal to zero. So therefore, that means at the cavity surface, the total charge is equal to minus Q1 plus Q2, okay? This means that if there's an electric field inside the cavity, so that's true. So there's an electric field inside, but within the conductor, the electric field is equal to zero. So that means if I choose some kind of a Gaussian surface within the conductor, but this Gaussian surface is such a is chosen such that the cavity is actually enclosed by the Gaussian surface. In that case, the enclosed charge should be zero. Okay. So therefore, I mean, this condition is kind of necessary in here. Uh, so let's say it like this. We should have like the charge on cavity surface. This basically on the conductor plus charge inside the cavity. This has to be equal to zero. That's what we are saying. So in this situation, for example, this is Q1 plus Q2. And this one is the basically the charge on the cavity surface. Okay. So they should add up to zero so that the uh, whatever. Not only they should add up to zero, but there's also the fact that this charge on the cavity surface should be distributed in such a way that the electric field produced by that surface charge exactly cancels the electric field produced by that charge, okay? So as a result, within the conductor, therefore, the electric field should be zero. 
Uh, since there is a charge collected at the cavity surface, there has to be some additional charges on the outer surface as well. So, I mean, you also have to think about this kind of possible feedback. Okay. Um, so there are some certain problems that we uh, usually ask that involve conductors, like conducting spheres or conducting spherical shells and things like that. So for these kind of things, uh, problems, you have to, first of all, decide how much charge goes which surface, and then uh, think of them as like surface charge distributions or something like that, and then solve the problem by using the alpha. Okay, I don't know if you have any questions. No, all right. So thank you very much. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll stop here. Uh, next week, I'll start with the, uh, uh, the potential concept. Right? So I'm going to do a summary of the concept. Thank you, sir.